Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. I'm Jesse Chappis and I'm here with Marnie Wasserman. Today we have nutritionist Peggy Katsopoulos on the show. We're so excited to bring you guys this amazing information. Peggy is a expert in the health world and she has such a great story and she's dropping all kinds of amazing information on the show. Yeah, she has a strong background in nutrition. She's made a life transition and uh, pursued her passion, and she's done so much with it. So we get into some really good things around, of course, making healthier choices, how to be more vibrant, which is kind of her mission statement, and some of the best vibrant foods that you can start consuming. And another big area is how to tackle PMS in a very holistic way, because this is such a big, big issue for women mainly. And uh, and how can we how can we not follow the same vicious cycles that I think a lot of girls fall into, which is you know eating improperly and suffering from a lot of the pain. So Peggy has some really amazing tips and strategies to get out of this cycle. Yeah, and there's something in this one for everybody, guys, girls, young, old. It's just a lot of great all-around health information as well, and you guys are going to really enjoy it. We're going to get into our latest contest now. So Marnie and I have implemented a voice message system on our website through a plugin called SpeakPipe. What this allows you guys to do is record a message to us actually a question. And what we're going to do is gather these up for a while and do a QA and a show where we're just asking question after question, or we're going to just start implementing them maybe in the openings of shows or at the end of shows or in the middle of shows. We'll, We'll figure it out. But we want you guys to go and leave us a short question. You can do it right through your computer if you don't have a microphone or if you have a Mike, you can plug in for better quality. That's great too. But head over, leave us a question. If you screw up when you're recording it, you can always just hit clear and do another one. There's no pressure or anything. And what we're going to do for a week after the show is released, we're going to gather all the questions at the end of the week. We're going to put them into our app that randomly picks a name. And we're going to pick somebody and send them free of charge a copy of Peggy's book, Kitchen Cures, and she's going to personally sign it to you. Yeah, and whoever the lucky winner is will, as Jesse said, get her book, which is loaded with a lot of information and recipes and tips. So uh, so that's awesome. So we also want you guys to still connect with us on Instagram at Ultimate Health Podcast, at Dr. Jesse Chappis, or at Marnie Wassman. What are you doing in the kitchen? What are you making or what are you doing to reach Ultimate Health? Because we will, we will connect with you there. And uh, we love seeing visually pictures of your life and your stories and what's going on, especially to uh, our loyal fans and listeners. So connect with us, be in touch, and uh, keep listening to our show because we've got so many good interviews lined up and so many exciting shows, and uh, we can't wait to share them with you. Yeah, and we've only shared a small amount of what's up and coming on today's show. If you want to get a summary, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com. There's a search bar there on the right. Type Peggy K in there if you're listening to this later. And her post with all this will come up or if you're listening right when it's released, it'll be right at the top there. But yeah, check out the show notes and make sure and interact with us over there too. Leave a comment on the blog and we'll definitely get back to you and interact. We want to really, as you can see, we want to continue to interact with you guys and just see who you are and, and keep the conversation going outside of the actual show. So Without further ado, here we go with Peggy Katsopoulos. Also known as Peggy K. Hey, Peggy, and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? We're good. We're, yeah. uh, we're really excited to talk to you. There's so many overlaps between you know your mission and what we stand for, so we're excited to start uh, talking about this. So let's just jump right into it. You left the corporate world to pursue nutrition kind of in your own way. So what was it that kind of stuck out for you and made you shift your focus? Yeah. So for me, I mean, I was into food and nutrition my whole life. My family, um, I mean, I, I grew up Greek, so all we did was revolve around food and, and it was very clean food. It was a Mediterranean diet. We had a garden in our backyard. So I was always into healthy eating just naturally. And we also had a restaurant growing up, my family. So it was very much centered around food. 
but I always had an awareness of how food made me feel. So when I was very young, five, for example, I knew I had, if I had a bag of chips, my face would feel greasy and I felt lethargic and gross and I hated that versus if I, if I had a pint of strawberries, my face would feel tingly and I felt energized. So I just had an awareness from a young age of how I felt. And when I was around 15 years old, I was in a car accident and I was a pedestrian and the car was going around 60 kilometers on impact when it hit me. So I was, I was injured really, really badly. And I remember realizing, and I was lucky to be alive. And I remember realizing at that age, how precious life is. And if we can choose to feel our best every single day, why wouldn't we? So I always would modify different recipes and foods to make it healthier because it made me feel better. And I wanted to feel my absolute best every single day. And so what, you know, the average, you know, the normal person does who has a passion for food and nutrition goes to school to do finance. So I ended up going to, um, I I ended up studying finance in in college and um, I ended up working in investments for seven years, but I was always into food and nutrition and people come to me at work and say, what are you eating? What is this, you know, what's the smoothie you're having every morning at breakfast? And, you know, what are these gluten-free muffins that you made? And, And one by one, everyone would ask questions. So I started doing lunch and learns. And talking about food and nutrition and saying, this is what I bring to work every day. It's really easy. This is what I eat for lunch. This is what I have for breakfast. This is what I make when I go home for dinner. And I started doing lunch and learns and it turned into a corporate wide wellness program. I love to do that. Like it was just, it was just kind of my passion, you know, filtered throughout the corporate sec- sector. And I was going to take another job at another investment firm, not thinking I would leave. I always thought, I wish I became a nutritionist. I wish I did this, but eight years into it and you progress in your career, it's very hard to make that change. And I remember um, I got offered a really good job at a small uh, boutique investment firm and it was, it was a partner position and I thought for sure I'm going to take it. And I went down, but before I resigned from my current job and started that job, I went down to um, Mendocino, California, and I did a culinary arts course in whole food nutrition um, at Living Light. And when I was there, I was there for about four weeks and I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I'm meant to do. This is what I'm passionate about. And I really want to make a difference. And I remember meeting this man who had stage four, he was probably in the seventies from, he was from Los Angeles and he had stage four lung cancer. And when I met him, so he said he had it a year ago and he went through 16 rounds of chemo and radiation. And the doctor's like, dude, there's nothing we can do. You have about four weeks to live, go get your house in order. You're going to die. And this guy was like, you know what? That's not true. I'm going to fight this thing on my own. And he changed his diet and lifestyle and um, did alternative therapies. And a year later, when I had met him, his cancer was almost gone. And I thought, wow, how do I make this message mainstream? And I met so many other people like this. And I thought, how do I make this message mainstream? And they said, there's a health educator course that starts, you know, in a couple of weeks in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I was like, sign me up. And so I went back to Toronto and, and I went to that new employer and I said, if I take this job, I'll be very successful, but I'd rather be significant. And, you know, I left and three days later I was back in school in West Palm Beach, Florida. So it was, um, it was just me really just following my passion and really wanting to make real health mainstream. Wow, Peggy, that's a, a huge shift, especially for somebody who's coming out of the work world and then going back and getting the education. I'm sure a lot of fear came up when you're making those big decisions. Was that something you had to address and push through or what, how did that all come about? Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is it's, it's very scary. And I think that's what took me so long to make the switch was it's always fear. It's always like, well, it's too late now. And how am I going to start? And where am I going to start? And it's scary. And it's scary to leave something that is seemingly secure. I mean, not really secure, but we think it is. It's a perceived um, security to do something into what we don't know, going into the unknown. So there is a lot of fear there. And the thing is, what I had to realize is you really have to believe in yourself even when no one else does. And I mean, everyone around me thought, what? Are you crazy? You're doing this. You're doing, what are you doing? And no one really understands it, but you just have to really be true to yourself and say, no, this is what I want. And this is what I want to do for myself and really believe in yourself. It's just trying to find that fire in your belly and that's what drives you because, and, and the reality is that what you have to do is just not think about it. Cause if you start to think about, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And how's it going to happen? And what are my next steps? That's what becomes scary. But when you just focus on the what, and for me, it was like, no, I have a message and I want to make this message mainstream and I don't care how it happens. 
it's going to happen. And just believing in that and believing in yourself and not listening to everyone else. And I realized that you really can't ask everyone their opinions because it starts to sway your opinion and, and just not think about it. I just had to, I literally had three days to do it. And I remember, uh, you know, one of the guys at the firm that I was supposed to start with, and he said to me, he's like, well, what are you going to do? When I turned down the job, he's like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I have no idea, but it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> and it's just really believing that and um, really you know, not focusing on the fear because it is scary. And if you think about how scary it is, it just become, it makes you become more afraid to do it. So it's just trying to find the excitement in it. And that's what drove me was the excitement in it and that there's something new and adventurous. And it's cool that I don't know what's going to come out of it. And I'm going to still be okay, even if it does flop and I don't know what what I'm going to do. I'm still going to be okay. And it's believing that and really believing in yourself. Totally. And I can relate. You know, when I I went to uh, York University, I did kinesiology and then my thought pattern was I'm going to become a dietitian. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I gathered whatever I needed to do that. But holistic nutrition came up at the same time I found out about it and I was leaning towards it, but didn't quite know. And, you know, I went to Ryerson for a year. I did dietetics, but I was so scared to leave that program thinking I needed to follow a, you know, a linear path to the top. And yeah, yeah, I followed my passion, followed my heart. And, you know, I've, I've carved out my own way. So that's a very important message too for our listeners, wherever you are, whether you're in a career or you're making some kind of change at home, just to follow that passion, that drive inside, because it will ultimately lead you to where you want to go. Exactly. So it sounds like Peggy, you also did some other trainings as well and kept that knowledge uh, flowing in the world of nutrition. So what else did you do and which one kind of really set the tone for where you are now? Yes. Yeah, so I got my um, my RHN from the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition, CSNN. Simultaneously, what I did was um, I when I went, when I, you know, when that guy said, well, sign up for this health educator course in West Palm Beach, that was at Hippocrates Health Institute. And I did that at the same time as I did my CSN, CSNN. I did my RHN designation through distance learning. And I think the best training for me was going to Hippocrates in West Palm Beach because we had to actually live everything that we preached. So people go there, it's almost like a healing center. So a lot of people go there to heal. So people are there with cancer, with, you know, whether they have heart disease, whether they have lupus, whether they have, you know, any type of autoimmune disease, and they go there to heal. And it's a pretty powerful thing to watch people's lives transform for the better when they think they have no hope. A lot of people go there for last resort. And they think, okay, you know what? I've tried everything. It's not working. Let me just try this. What do I have to lose? And it's amazing to see transformation. And so just to be there with the, with these people, like I, we did a separate course. So we had to do this. It was called like a three week life change program that everyone does that does this program. And then the health ed- educators stay on, you know, for a couple of months to do education. But when you're there every in the same kind of environment as these people that are healing and you get to work with them and talk to them and see the transformation, that is so powerful. And any kind of cleanse that we talk about or do, so say if it's a liver cleanse, you know, a colon cleanse, whatever it is, we've actually had to do it ourselves. So I've done so many cleanses and, and so many modalities and treatments and therapies and everything that everyone's ever done. I've actually done it to my own body. So I know firsthand what to experience and what the impact it has on my body and what the results are and seeing other people go through it. So it wasn't just a, you know, a practical, it wasn't just a learning where you're just like reading about it and learning about it and, you know, doing assignments. It's actual real life people and you're actually doing it to yourself at the same time. So for me, it was just, it was transformative. I I learned so much in that short period of time and just to see the change in people and just to see the change in myself, it was phenomenal. That's great. Full immersion, getting in there, yeah. trying things on yourself and seeing the differences it makes. That That is just priceless when you come into practice and start working with clients. So yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And Peggy, mm-hmm. when, when I think Hippocrates, they advocate a plant-based vegan diet. I'm wondering, was that something... I'm not sure. I'm first curious what what it is you're consuming now food wise. Like what's mm-hmm. your current diet look like? Mm-hmm. And was that a diet that you toyed with, stuck with? Like what how did that all come about with your yeah. your dietary evolution? 
Yeah. So my diet has changed significantly many times over the past years, over the past probably 15 years. So before, um, before I went to Hippocrates, I was actually vegan. So the way it started was I would just start eliminating things from my diet. So before, like when I was in investments and not, you know, I was always into food and nutrition, but I wasn't following a particular diet. The first thing I cut up my diet was dairy because I was a runner. So I always ran and I was mucousy. And I thought, you know, there's a nutritionist that came to the running room one day and said, well, if you don't have dairy 24 hours before you race, because, you know, it's mucus forming. And I thought, well, if I run every day, why would I eat dairy, period? And I noticed a difference. So I cut out dairy for my diet. And then slowly I started cutting out meat from my diet. Then I started cutting out fish from my diet and I became, I was vegan. And then through this whole process, and it's funny, this is how I say food really affects how you think and how you feel. And because what, what happened, what I started doing when I was in investments and I was trying to make this change in my career was a lot of times we eat to bury feelings or we eat as a distraction. And once you start eating more clean, once you start eliminating things from your diet, like I went from vegan to raw food vegan. So I was actually raw food vegan before I even went to Hippocrates. And I was, I mean, I would eat some cooked food, like lentil soup or something. I was really into juicing. And when I went to Living Light Culinary Arts Institute, that was also a lot of raw food. And I was doing juice cleanses and all this kind of stuff. And what happens is when you kind of quiet your stomach, like when you cleanse, this is why when you cleanse, it's not just a physical cleanse that you're doing to your body. It's a mental, spiritual, emotional cleanse. Because when we eat, when you think of our body as an energetic being, for example, say, you know, you know, there's our physical being, our spiritual being, our emotional being. And when we eat, a lot of our energy goes to digesting food. And when we eat less or when we eat cleaner and our body's not working so hard to digest, our energy can shift. So instead of going towards 80% of your energy goes towards food and, you know, 20% goes to your emotional, spiritual being, say 50% goes to digesting and 50% goes to your emotional, spiritual being. So more energy kind of shifts. And that's when we start freaking out in a way or like, oh my God, why am I feeling this way? Or why do these emotions come up? So that's what kind of happened with me. And that's when I was like, well, what, what is my purpose in this life? What, what do I want to do that's more? And I started asking these questions where before I just kind of was in the motions. I had a good job. I was doing well. I had the quintessential perfect life essentially where I was kind of where you wanted to be at that age but I wasn't happy. And so the more I started eating clean and I did this, you know, living food stuff, I was asking these questions. And so that's why it made my career change. But so, but what happened was when I went to Hippocrates, it was at that diet, it was raw food, vegan diet. And I was really hardcore at that point because I wanted to do the program. I wanted to follow it. I wanted to see what it would have on me. I did that for about, I think total of three years, I was raw food vegan. And then after a year after Hippocrates, I just felt I was craving cooked foods. Like I was craving warm soups and hearty soups. So I started doing that and I felt better. Then all of a sudden I was like, I was just craving like fish. Like I remember I was living in Florida at the time and I was like, I'm craving like a, like a meaty protein. And my, it was just so loud and clear in my body. And I remember I went and I hadn't had fish in like, I don't know, eight years or something. And I went to the, the, the sea. Like I literally went, I'm like, if I'm going to have fish, I'm going to have like the best fish ever. And I remember I paid like $28 for this piece of salmon <laughs> and I brought it home and I just cooked it like with, you know, um, you know, some lemon and some dill and fresh dill. And I was like, my cells were doing backflips in my body. Like it felt so good in my body. I just felt so energized and I felt grounded and I realized, oh my gosh, my body needs this. And so I've gone through like so many different evolutions in terms of foods and diets to know that what works for me and what doesn't work for me. So, I mean, there's certain foods like right now, I'm, I think I'm at a really good place where I don't have a specific category that I fall into. I don't have a box that I fall into in terms of what my diet looks like. I just know what works for me. And it's, it's still mostly plants, but I love steamed foods. I, for me, it's more grounding versus raw. Like I love salads. I'll eat, especially in the summer, I'll eat mostly raw. I still juice. I do my smoothies, but I love steamed vegetables and I love fish. Like I love, for me, it really works for me. And I just kind of do what, what feels right for my body. I, I really listen to my body in terms of what I need at a certain period of time. And that makes perfect sense. And something mm-hmm. else you brought up, which is the emotional and physical impact of food. And that's a huge component for a lot of people and not being connected to that, you know, that impact on the body. So let's talk about that because I know you focused a lot on that and how that related to you and maybe now the, how that's related into the things that you've done in your books and in your teaching. So mm-hmm. what is that impact and yeah. how, how do we deal with that? 
Yeah. So food really does affect the way we feel. It affects our physical energy. It affects our, you know, emotional well-being. It affects our mood, our happiness. And that's why we have to be really conscious about what we put in, in inside our body because it really is our fuel for everything that we do. Like from a physical point of view, it does energize us. It does fuel us. The quality of the foods that we add to our diet affects the quality of our energy that we put out. So we want to make sure that we're incorporating vibrant foods, foods that are going to energize us. Even from, you know, and I talked about the, the, um, the emotional stuff as well and also the mood. But when you think about certain foods, I mean, like even just talk about like depression is a huge thing right now um, with so many people and their mood and hormonal balancing. And food directly impacts your mood. Food has more of a direct effect on your mood than any kind of antidepressant that you would actually take. And studies have shown that. Like, I mean, omega-3s, the high dosages of omega-3s are just as effective as an antidepressant. And I mean, foods can affect the amount of neurotransmitters, the quality of the neurotransmitters in your brain, B vitamins, B6 particularly that's found in your food, helps with the transmission and the production of neurotransmitters in your brain. And the only way you can actually increase serotonin in your brain, which is your happy neurotransmitter, is through food. All antidepressants do is kind of, you know, recycle the amount of serotonin in your brain. It doesn't necessarily produce more of it. It just kind of keeps it trapped in there and recycles it. The only way you can actually increase more of it is through foods, like, for example, foods containing tryptophan, um, which converts to serotonin, Um, having your B vitamins, your zinc, which helps with that production of it. And that's what you get through your food. So the quality of the food that you eat directly affects your mood. And, And the same goes for the opposite. I mean, these are all good foods. The same goes for the opposite. If you start putting junk in your body, you get junk out. Sugar is found in so many different things, and I think it's you know probably the worst thing that we can add to our diet. All these hidden sugars and highly refined processed sugars, and that wreaks havoc on your mood and your energy levels, and causes you know an ill effect on your health. So, food really does impact your physical being, your emotional being, and your spiritual well being. And we know you use the word and the term "be vibrant." So, what mm-hmm. foods specifically help us become more vibrant? Yeah. So for this, this is where I go to. I think when it comes to um, vibrancy, this is where we do want to incorporate like our plant-based foods, heavily focused on plant, plant-based foods and mostly, you know, raw foods here because they do keep, you know, the vibrancy of it. When you think about, um, you know, the energy that comes from food that we're putting inside our, our body. So one example I love to use all the time when I talk about vibrant foods is, okay, greens, for example, we always hear eat your greens, eat your greens. And then there's good, there's good, better, best. So good are your your macro greens, your dark leafy greens, things like spinach, kale, collards. Better are your sprouts. And these are things like sunflower sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, broccoli sprouts. And the thing is, what I love about sprouts, sprouts, I think they're one of the most vibrant foods, is because they're so nutrient dense. They have up to 600 times, you know, more nutrients than than the seed itself or, or a macro green. And like when you think about a sunflower sprouts, and I love using this example is when you see how they're grown. So they take the sunflower seeds, you soak them, um, and you can, you know, grow them on cafeteria trays. So you get a cafeteria tray, line it with soil, and then you get your soaked seeds because, you know, when you soak them like for eight to 12 hours, they germinate and they become alive. You're waking it up. So it's becoming vibrant. The seed itself is just becoming alive. You put them on top of your sunflower seeds. I mean, on top of your soil, you get another cafeteria tray put it on top of the seats, you're covering them. And then you can get like the heaviest bricks ever, like concrete bricks, throw them on top. You can even stand on these trays. And even if you stand it, stood on these trays with bricks for a whole week, these sprouts would actually grow and lift you up. Like you can stand there and they would keep growing and they would raise you. That's how powerful these little sprouts are because these tiny little sprouts have to grow into huge sunflower plants. So when you get them at you know, that beginning stage of their journey, like when they're just, when you harvest them right at the beginning stage of their journey, they're just so alive. And when you put that into your body, you have, there's no way you can't feel vibrant and feel energized and feel alive. Like you're just adding all this great nutrition into your diet. So, I mean, it's those types of foods that you add. Also, algae is like the best in terms of greens when it comes to chlorophyll, you know, chlorella. I love chlorella. I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, I find it really energizing, really cleansing. Um, but even just like, like colorful foods, like, you know, your red bell peppers, you know, purple carrots, high, foods high in antioxidants. Uh, these are great for vibrant health. Yeah, it's interesting because I've talked about this a number of times where there's only a couple of things I can think of that energize me besides taking a stimulant like caffeine or, or theobromine. Mm-hmm. And that is 
sprouts, like putting a ton of sprouts in a salad or juicing them, or mm. green juice. There's something yeah. about it where it just, you feel alive. It's like having, it's almost like having caffeine because you just, it wakes you up and you feel good and it's so nourishing. So yeah. juicing for Marnie and I, and especially green juices are such an important part of our, our routine. And yeah. that brings me to green powders. We also are a fan of a couple of really high quality green powders that we use on a daily basis, usually in the morning, almost like an insurance that we're getting yeah. all kinds of vitamins, minerals, probiotics. Is this something you recommend? And is there any brand that you think is is worth noting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a big fan of that because... I, like you said, it's kind of like your insurance policy, knowing that you get all your vitamins and minerals in a day. So even though, you know, you eat clean, it's, you still want to make sure you're getting everything. And if you know, you get that in the morning, you feel like, okay, I'm good. I'm good for the day. And everything else is like bonus. And I do the same thing. So for me, I mean, in terms of green powders or green um, capsules, I, I mean, I, like I said, I love chlorella. And the reason being is because it's the highest source of chlorophyll on the planet. Like it's just, it's for me, it's really energy boosting. I've been doing it, I don't know, for probably the first time I got my hands on it was probably like in 99 and uh, 1999. And I was just, ever since then, it's kind of like, I'm addicted to it. I hate to say I'm addicted to anything, but I like, I just, I, I feel like I, I have to have it <laughs> every day. And um, it's just, it's, you know, everyone always used to say, even when I was in investments, they're like, where do you get your energy from? I'm like, I think it's chlorella, I swear. <laughs> and it's because it's so high in chlorophyll, which increases the number of red blood cells in your body, which, you know, deliver oxygen to your cells. So you're more energized. And that's why, you know, like you said, with green juices, it does the same thing for me. I have a green juice and I feel great. And it's just almost like this instant surge of, good energy, not that nervous energy that caffeine would give you, but just like a really good, vibrant energy. I also do for my morning smoothie, I do Vega, the Vega one. And that has your greens. It has spirulina in there. It has like six servings of greens per serving. Plus it has your vitamins and minerals and it's all plant-based. All your vitamins and minerals come from whole food ingredients. It has your omega-3 fatty acids in there. It has your antioxidants in there. It has maca in there. So it has everything. It has probiotics in there. So it has everything that I would take in a day. It really reduced reduces the amount of you know supplements you have to take just by taking that. So I make a smoothie every single morning with my Vega One. And even though it has chlorella in there, I still take chlorella on top of that. So you can either add the powder to your smoothie, but I just, I find for me, I take, it comes in a press tablet. And for me, it's just easier because I find with the powder, I make such a mess of it. And getting chlorophyll out of your tiles is like the worst thing ever. <laughs> you know, if you spill it, it's like, forget it. I'm scrub scrubbing green for days. So I just find it just easier and, and neater more than anything. But um, I do a Vega One smoothie every single morning. Yeah, with the chlorella, that's something that Jesse and I, we've talked about our morning drink on the show a lot. So our listeners are, are well aware of it. And we throw uh, usually some kind of green powder in yeah. our, and sometimes it rotates and chlorella sometimes gets thrown into the mix in our morning yeah. green drinks. So that's a really easy way to get it in. Or yeah. just like right now, we just actually, as you were talking about it, we just shove some chlorella tablets. Back. Exactly, right? <laughs> like it's so easy. <laughs> Why not? That's what I do. I'm like, I don't leave home without my chlorella, honestly. Yeah. That's my yeah. favorite thing. But also another one that I used to use a lot and sometimes I still do is the vitamin mineral green. Yes, we love that one. Yeah, love, love that one too. And same with the um, the Sun Warrior or Miss Super Greens. We're, we're big on that one. Yeah, those, that's an excellent one as well. So I'm going to jump into the topic of PMS because that's a big yeah. uh, a big topic and something we haven't really delved too much into on the podcast and talked about some of the symptoms and ways to manage that. So for mm -hmm. the woman out there, you know, I think this is a huge area and I know you've you've done some uh, research on this. So yes. let's talk about some tips on how to manage this and make this time of month uh, a little bit smoother. Yeah. So this is, I mean, this is a, this is a big topic for, for most many women. And I find it's becoming more and more of an issue with women and symptoms can vary. Some, some people get crazy cramps. Some people don't get cramps. They get mood swings and it's just, it, they just feel like their world is ending. They can't think their brain doesn't work. And these are all normal feelings to be having during this time of month. Um, but it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a normal thing that you have to go through. And I mean, your hormones are, are going, are fluctuating. They're, um, you know, there's imbalances of hormones and this is all stuff that we can, we can address through food too. When it comes to uh, managing your symptoms, there's, there's certain things that you can actually do to help it. And there's a couple of products that I'll talk about after, 
Um, but I just want to talk about some key ingredients first. Um, and then I can talk about th- there's different brands that are really good that really help you know, to get through the cycle. But, you know, one of the things that over and over and over, and there's numerous studies that show is um, a calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D supplement. Now, estrogen actually regulates your calcium metabolism. And since estrogen levels are changing across your entire menstrual cycle, calcium absorption fluctuates throughout this time. So it's by actually supplementing, and it doesn't even have to be a calcium supplement, but you can actually just incorporate calcium-rich foods, almonds, almond butters, um, broccoli. Um, broccoli is actually an excellent food, and I'll talk about it later why. But um, you know these types of foods into your diet throughout your the month. It's not you don't want to address the issue once you get your period a lot of times, or just before your period. Everyone's like, oh, I'm getting PMS symptoms. What do I do now? This is something that happens over the long term. This is something that what you do from day one of your cycle will impact how you are at day 28 of your cycle. So it has to be a constant thing. It's not, and it's, this is not a symptom. It's not a band-aid solution. So this is stuff that you just want to do. I just want to make it clear that this is a lifestyle change, not just a band-aid solution change. And that's with anything when it comes to health. But ca- calcium is really important. And even a study from Columbia University showed that women who received 1,200 mel- uh, milligrams of calcium a day had a 50% reduction in PMS symptoms. And that's for over three menstrual cycles. So that's really important. Magnesium is key when it comes to cramping um, and PMS because it relaxes your nerves, it relaxes your muscles. You know, and I always say, like, even in my book, I talk about PMS. I always say, please make it stop. <laughs> that's what it should stand for because it's, you know, I understand it's like it's a horrible thing. And growing up, I used to have, you know, really, really bad cramps. So I, I know what that's like. But magnesium is so important to actually relax your your uterus and to relax your the muscles that contract and and to relax your nerves and and make the process bearable and you need magnesium to help with calcium absorption they work together as well and same thing with vitamin D yes and all three are, work together very much so and yeah the product calm is something we've talked about before on the podcast and I'm sure you know it it's such a great form of liquid magnesium for for soothing the the tummy area <laughs> during that time yes Yes. And since you kind of touched upon a little bit, and I know it's a big one and it kind of gets left hanging for some people, is the calcium supplementation that so many women are dependent on through mainstream media, through their doctors. Yeah. Do you want to just lightly touch upon it and what some of the challenges are with taking kind of traditional calcium supplements that are just so widely available? Yeah. And that's the thing. And I'm not like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a advocate of magnesium. Like you said, the liquid, the calm liquid magnesium is amazing. And we need, like, we have an abundance of calcium in our body. So every time, you know, they, they put this, you know, fear of God in us that, you know, we need calcium, we need calcium. Well, it's the most abundant mineral in our body. What we, what we become deficient in is magnesium. And that's what we really need for optimal utilization of the calcium we already have in our body. And, you know, things like vitamin K as well, which stick calcium to your bones. And these are all found in dark leafy greens. When you supplement with a calcium, that's why you get calcium deposits. It can cause heart disease. It can increase your risk of heart attacks. It can cause more damage to your joints over the long term by supplementing with a mainstream over-the-counter calcium supplement. So the best way to get your calcium is through your foods. So through your plant-based foods, it's absorbable. Same thing with milk. Milk is the worst thing when it comes to bone health. The milk industry has done such an excellent job of saying you need calcium for your bones and you need milk for your bones. Well, when you look at studies and countries with the highest incidence, and, and I know you've talked about this too, countries with the highest incidence of dairy consumption have the highest incidence of osteoporosis. So it's through your plant-based sources that make it absorbable, but it's the other nutrients. So it's the things like magnesium and vitamin D and vitamin K, which help utilize calcium in your body. Bone density is tied to your estrogen as well. And estrogen is tied to bone density. We have to really focus on an estrogen balance and a hormonal balance. And this goes with your PMS symptoms. This goes with weight gain. If we don't have the right amounts of estrogen in our body, we're not going to have really good bone density. So when I talk about supplements that I mentioned and foods like broccoli, if you're suffering from PMS symptoms, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, these foods are amazing. And you should, and if you suffer from any kind of PMS symptom, you should be incorporating some variety of this food into your diet every single day, every single day. And the reason being is because it contains fiber and fiber is 
so essential when it comes to PMS symptoms. We don't think about it, but fiber actually helps to absorb onto excess estrogens in your body and eliminate it. Also, the indole 3 carbonyls, the I3Cs that are found in these foods. And what it does is typically when we have PMS symptoms, sometimes it's associated with a hormonal imbalance and we can have too much bad estrogen relative to a weaker beneficial estrogen in our body and also relative to progesterone and testosterone. So there can be just an imbalance in these hormones. And with the indole 3 carbonyls, do these foods such as you know your broccoli, your cauliflower, they kind of bind onto these excess estrogens and eliminate it from your body. And these foods also, like I said, contain calcium, do a magnesium supplement. The magnesium supplement will help relax, again, relax your muscles, relax your nerves, relax your tummy, your uterus, and omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are key. They're your essential fatty acids. And by incorporating them into your diet every single day, it helps with hormonal balancing. It also helps alleviate pain in your body. It's an anti-inflammatory. So it will actually reduce that inflammation and pain that you you feel during that, that time of the month. Well, Peggy, a controversial topic around omega-3s is plant sources versus animals. So I'm wondering, is there a certain source that you recommend and somebody that's on a vegan diet, can they get enough from plants? Yeah, absolutely. If you're on a vegan diet, you can't get enough through plants. Ascenta is my favorite brand for both. I take a fish oil because I eat fish. And I, I like that fish oil because the types of fishes that they use, they're not highly contaminated. But if you are on a vegan diet, they also have one from an algae that has just as good quality omega-3 fatty acids that you can get through your algae, through your plant-based sources as well. So yes, you can get the same amount of omega-3 fatty acids. Okay. And, and they're essential to take regardless, regardless of if, you know whether you're vegan or not vegan. There, there are sources to take them and it's beneficial to take them. For sure, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about some of the cravings and giving in to some of the bad foods that most women yeah. crave during, you know, the chocolate is always a go-to. And of course, there's good chocolate, there's bad chocolate, but uh-huh. most people are feeding into and giving into the fact that I'm on my period, eh, I can eat cupcakes, yeah. I can eat yeah. whatever I want. So how does this make the cycle that much worse. Yeah. Oh, it's a good excuse, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like if we can find any excuse, it's like, I deserve it today. Yeah. But you know, my body's just craving it. I have to have it. But um, yeah, no, it, it can make, it, it depends on the quality. So let's just talk about chocolate for a second. Like you said, there's good chocolate and there's bad chocolate. So when it comes to cravings, a lot of times we all crave chocolate because it increases endorphins in our body and it makes us feel better. And it's scientifically actually proven to make us feel better. And raw chocolates, when you look at raw chocolate, for example, like the good quality chocolate that comes from the cacao bean, it is the highest plant-based source of magnesium. And magnesium we talked about is really important to help relax our nerves, you know, relax our body, relieve that muscle tension. And chocolate is the highest plant-based source. Raw chocolate is the highest plant-based source of magnesium. So it's really good during this time of the month to have the magnesium and to have that raw chocolate. Where it gets tricky is when we have over-the-counter processed chocolates or chocolate that's combined with so much refined sugars, because it's the sugar that impacts our body negatively. And it's the sugar that causes more cravings and it balances our blood sugar levels and will cause us to feel worse. So Peggy, let's talk about some of the barriers that people may have with adopting a healthy lifestyle. Why is it such a challenge when there's so much information out there from nutritionists such as us and so many different health leaders in the world? People know, but they don't implement. Why do you think? I think it's it's overwhelming for a lot of people. And I think it's a fear of change. And food is such a sensitive topic for many people, and it's a form of habit for many people. Number one, I think it's they don't know how. There's so many people that I know, they're like, I want to eat healthier, and I want to do this, but I don't know how to. And for us nutritionists, sometimes we're like, but it's so easy. You just like swap this out for this in the morning. And But it's a big change for people. It's a big change to create a habit. And it just becomes very overwhelming, and they don't know where to start. I think what a lot of people think is they have to overhaul their entire diet overnight and they have to to make a health change. But really is if they just start with one thing, one thing, like if you want to add, you know, lemon water to your breakfast, you know, before you have breakfast every single morning, as soon as you wake up or, you know, swap out a sugary juice for like a, it doesn't even have to be a green juice, but just with water, <laughs> you know, just, just doing a switch like that. Like you don't have to go from drinking soda to drinking green juice. It's just one incremental change and you'll start to feel better with one change. If you can do like one change a week and then do a second change and then a third change, you'll just naturally want to eat better because you'll feel better. 
I think a job as us, as nutritionists, is we educate, we, we can provide them with information, but it's up to that person just to make that one small change. And they have to come to us for more. And that's what I realized. Like even when I first started as a nutritionist and I would see clients, I'd be like, this is what you have to do. And this is your new diet. And this is what you have to have for breakfast and lunch and dinner. And they're all like, whoa, <laughs> like it's, it's scary. Whereas if it's just like, okay, you know what? Here's one thing that you do every day, swap it for this. And then they, they're like, oh, I can do that. That's it. I'm like, yep, yeah, that's it. And then then they can do it and they want to do more and they want to do more. And they start to come to you because they want to take it to the next level versus making a huge change all at once. So it can be overwhelming, but it doesn't need to be. So it's just really starting small. And it's just, like I said, it's that fear of change. I think a great starting point for a beginner would be to swap out breakfast with a green smoothie. And, and that smoothie can be really simple, like a handful of spinach, a rice milk or an almond milk with a good quality protein powder. We personally love the the Sun Warrior, Vega. There's a number of great ones on the market. So if somebody was to put together a really simple smoothie and, and maybe a tablespoon of coconut oil, like to get a good healthy fat in there, just from our experience, that's that's an easy in for people. And once you start doing that, you will start feeling better and you'll feel the difference. And then one thing leads to the next. And before you know it, you you've swapped in a lot of amazing things and some of the nasty habits just start going by the wayside. Exactly what you said, a smoothie. That's what I always recommend with my clients too. Doing a smoothie every single morning for breakfast. The first, it's your breakfast. It's your first meal of the day. Do you know how many times people come to me and they say, I have so much energy at lunchtime. I'm not crashing at my desk anymore and I'm not doing this. And it's, it's probably the best way. If you could just start off with your breakfast, just like you said, a simple smoothie and they'll feel better after a week. Sure. And I think one thing to consider is to make sure you get that healthy fat, healthy protein in there, because Mm -hmm. a lot of times I think people starting out especially aren't aware of that and they feel hungry right away. So when you get some more satiating, heavier, healthy ingredients in there, those smoothies can really power you right through the morning, like you said. And one thing that pops into my head as we're discussing this is pressure from family and friends as people start making these changes, I think that can be a huge barrier, especially if somebody say they're middle-aged, they have a family, they just are tired of feeling tired and they're tired of watching their health slowly degrade. What can somebody do to get the ball rolling without having a big influence on say the rest of the family while they're getting their feet wet? There's a couple of things. I think the first thing, just because you make a change like in your family doesn't mean you need to make a change for everyone else in their family. I think that's when it starts to get more complicated because there's so much resistance around them. And I think if you just kind of contain it for yourself and just make your own meals separately, I mean, you still, still can eat together as a family. And then I think it's leading by examples. When people look around you and they say, wow, your skin looks so much cleaner and your eyes look brighter and you look like you lost a couple of pounds, you look great. And people want to start doing what you're doing. So I think that's the best way to do it. And are there some specific foods that you'd recommend for glowing skin? Because that is what everybody wants at the end of the day. Yes, yes. Actually, fat. So we talked about like not only to satiate you, um, but fats and proteins are really, really good for amazing skin, particularly fats like coconut oils, avocados, olives. That gives you that inside out moisture. It helps with hormonal balancing. So if you do suffer from acne, it can actually help to mitigate that. But it just gives you that naturally inside out glowing skin. So fats are so important when it comes to skin health. Hydration. So drinking clean water, hydrating foods like watermelon, like this time of the year, watermelon's amazing. And um, it has the lycopene in there, which actually can help mitigate. It's an antioxidant that can help mitigate some of the sun damage, but it's so hydrating. Cucumbers are really hydrating and, you know, antioxidants. So things like your berries, strawberries, blueberries prevent free radical damage in your body. Great answer. I love how you went within the body to have the skin glow on the outside. And that just makes me think about cellulite. This is a common problem with a lot of people. We hear it all the time. Are the same strategies you just gave us going to help with cellulite? Yeah. When it comes to cellulite, there's like absolutely nothing in the world that can fix it, like nothing, but you can actually mitigate the appearance of it. And what the number one thing that when it comes to cellulite is hydration, you need to be hydrated. Even the slightest dehydration in your body will exacerbate the appearance of cellulite. 
So just by making sure you're well hydrated all the time will minimize that appearance of cellulite. And so that's from the inside out. Say if you have something and you just really you know, you, you just have that like little cottage cheese effect or, you know, that orange peel effect and you really want to minimize it as well. A temporary fix is caffeine on the outside. I always say never caffeine on the inside. It's, it's hydration on the inside. Drinking caffeine can dehydrate you and exacerbate the appearance of cellulite. So it's water on the inside and caffeine on the outside. And so what the caffeine does is it actually kind of dehydrates the outside, like the little, so it's basically a little, you know, fat deposits that are kind of pushing through your dermis, kind of like that little cage, which is why you have the appearance of it. What the, the caffeine does is it kind of minimizes that puffiness. So just by putting it on top. So if, what I like to do is I'll take some coffee, some ground up coffee, and you mix it with some coconut oil. So just melt some coconut oil or some olive oil and just like make a little paste and just rub it around, you know, the areas of your body where you have cellulite kind of in a circular motion in the direct towards the direction of your heart and leave it on there for about 20 minutes and get in the bathtub and wash it all off. And you can use like if you make, if somebody makes coffee at home and they have a coffee you know, they put it through a coffee machine, a coffee maker, you can actually use that leftover coffee. So you don't waste it. I mean, a brand new coffee you can do that. But that's really good. And dry skin brushing. If you just have a, like a dry brush, before you go in the shower, brush in the direction towards your heart every single day, that'll help minimize the appearance of cellulite as well. It gets, you know, it gets your fluids moving, gets your lymphatic system moving, and it can help minimize the appearance. Great tips. So I also want to talk about metabolism and just ways that we can rev it up or, you know, manage it. Because again, this is, you know, from the female perspective, a lot of women yeah. are really obsessed with balancing their metabolism and, and helping moving things along. So what do you suggest? Is it eating small meals? Is it certain specific foods? You know, there's apple cider vinegar, there's lemon juice, mm -hmm. there's so much stuff out there. So what do you recommend? Yeah. So when it comes to metabolism, I mean, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm an advocate of exercise. <laughs> I, I mean, foods definitely can help. Um, and I'll talk about specific foods that can boost your metabolism. But really what it comes down to is you don't want to starve yourself for like 10 hours in a day. That's the worst thing that you can do. You want to make sure that you're eating in a day. And it doesn't have to be six small meals in a day. It could be four small meals in a day or you have to figure out what works best for you, but you have to be eating um, good quality foods. But exercise is the, the, I really want to boost your metabolism. And if you really want to lose weight, you still need to exercise. You can't just have a sedentary lifestyle and expect to have a, a, a boost in metabolism. So when it comes to exercise, what I love to boost metabolism is high intensity and interval training. So sprinting on a treadmill. So you can sprint for a minute, walk for a minute, sprint for a minute, jump squats, plyometrics, something that gets your whole body. So if you're doing weight training or that kind of stuff, using your body weight, but you're really getting your heart rate up and you don't have to work out for an hour. It can be 20 minutes of your day, but just something that really gets your heart rate up at a high intensity for little um, spurts of time is the best way to boost your metabolism. And you're going to actually have your metabolism revved for the entire day. So exercise is key when it comes to metabolism. Also, like I said, you have to eat. And then, you know, like there are foods that can boost your metabolism temporarily. So, you know, caffeine, like herba mate or green tea helps to boost your metabolism. Cayenne pepper that creates that heat, generates that heat will help to boost your metabolism because it gets your heart rate up. So really anything that gets your heart rate up will boost your metabolism. But exercise, I think, is the best way to get your heart rate up. Your thyroid is direct, directly responsible for your metabolism. So if you are suffering from a sluggish metabolism uh, or sluggish thyroid, kelp will actually help increase the amount of iodine in your blood, which gets absorbed by your thyroid to uh, manufacture and produce hormones in your body. So that's an easy little fix that you can add to your diet as well. Awesome. And sticking on the topic of foods that give us a boost, let's talk about libido. And you mentioned maca earlier. I know that's yeah. a common one that people go to right away when they hear about libido boosting foods. Is there truth behind that? And is there other foods that we can consider to throw in the mix? Yeah. So, I mean, maca, yeah, maca has been touted for um, its libido boosting properties. And, and the reason why it does that is because in order really for your libido to be boosted, it, it, again, it comes down to hormones and you want to have the proper hormonal balance. And particularly, you want to have higher levels of testosterone. And so maca helps to do that. Zinc foods like pumpkin seeds, for example, high in zinc helps to do that as well. But what maca, what makes maca really great is it balances your endocrine system. So your hormones are imbalanced without 
without affecting your blood hormone levels. So I like to use an analogy just to explain it. So all hormonal communication occurs between your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus to release the right amounts of hormones in the right quantities at the right time. Thing is that there's a slight imbalance. So you might be producing more estrogen in relation to testosterone or progesterone. That'll throw your hormones off. That can affect your libido. Now, what maca does, like I said, it balances your hormones without increasing blood hormone levels. And the way it does it is it improves the communication between your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus. So it re- releases the exact amounts of hormones in the right quantities in the right time. So it's, it's an adaptogen. This is the effect it has. So let's just say, for example, I use this analogy in my book. Let's just say I was watching football with my boyfriend and and I, I don't like football, so I'm not paying attention. And I'm like, oh, honey, I feel like some vanilla coconut ice cream. And one of two things happens. Either he totally ignores me and I don't get any ice cream, or he'll be like, oh, my gosh, let me get some ice cream to keep her quiet. And I get to watch my football game. So he goes to the freezer and he scoops me out some chocolate coconut ice cream and I ask for vanilla. So he brings me a bowl of chocolate. I'm like, I didn't ask for chocolate. And I'm all upset. So basically, I sent in information. I was like, I need this. He brings me something else. That's what happens to your body's hormone systems when it's when it, your body's hormones when it's off balance. You might be asking for more testosterone and sending you more estrogen. Your body goes off balance. Your libido is low. You have no energy. You're gaining weight. You know, you're getting man boobs and muffin tops and all this stuff. Now, let's just say him and I in this like pretend perfect world, we both were taking maca. And I said to him, honey, I feel like vanilla ice cream. And he'll be like, oh, he jumps out of his seat and he runs to the freezer and he gets me a big bowl of vanilla ice cream. That's what maca does to your endocrine system. It how, improves how much do that we communication. Need? Um, you, for normal health, uh, one and a half grams a day. Okay. Just for, just for regular maintenance. Thanks. No, that's helpful because I know some people don't really know and I know the taste for a lot of people can be off-putting. So yeah. when you do too much, it can be too much. <laughs> yeah. And the thing with maca too, you can cycle it. So do like three weeks on, one to three weeks off. You don't have to take it every single day. Right. You just yeah. want to cycle it. That's a very important point. Yeah. That's something mm-hmm. I, I suggest as well. Mm-hmm. So Peggy, we want to know a little bit more about you. So we want, if you can, break down your morning routine. What do you do once you wake up to get your day going? Okay. So for me, the first thing I do is I I always have, it's just a habit. I have water. I'm always like addicted to water. So I have water with my lemon in it in the morning and then I'll wake up a little bit (laughs) and I'll have, typically I'll just have, I'm obsessed with the Vega hydrator. So I just, I make sure I have a big thing of water because I go for, I work out in the morning. So I tend to just have something small. I might just have a little piece of apple, with maybe some almond butter on it, or I'll have a slice of spreaded grain bread, like maybe an Ezekiel bread with some coconut oil on it. Or sometimes I just have a tablespoon of coconut oil by itself, depending what I feel like. And I go to the gym in the morning. So that's, I do all my workout in the morning. I don't think about it. I just kind of go. And then I come back and I make myself a smoothie. So I use the Vega one. Sometimes I'll add a little bit of of their protein in it as well. So I might do half a scoop of the Vega one and depending on my workout and half a scoop of the um, Vega protein and vanilla. And I add just, I keep it very simple. I just add almond milk to it and I add either frozen strawberries or frozen blueberries. (laughs) I alternate between the two and the half of frozen banana and I'll blend it up and I add maybe a tablespoon of almond butter or a little bit of coconut oil. I just alternate between those combinations and sometimes I'll throw in some spinach or kale and I make a smoothie. That's my smoothie every single morning. It hasn't changed in years. That's what I do every morning. Awesome. It's amazing how many people, and it relates back to what we were talking about earlier, start the day with this smoothie. And it's just so, it just makes sense on so many levels. It's quick. It's, it's full of nutrients. It digests easily. So, I mean, after fasting all night, it's a great option. I guess the only concern is if you have other people in the house, if you're using one of those high speed blenders, I know. <laughs> it's not the most pleasant way to wake up in the morning, but, uh, yeah, but everyone will wake up. <laughs> there you go. As long as you have a smoothie ready for them, I think, uh, they may forgive you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, Peggy, we're going to start wrapping up here, but we want to get into some rapid fire questions. We're just going to ask you a handful of questions and we'd like you just to answer first thing that comes to mind. How's that okay. sound? Yeah. Okay, so to get things going here, we're halfway through the year. What is one of your goals for the rest of 2015? To do more and think less. That sounds really good. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> to feel sorry, to feel more and, and think less. Sometimes, okay. if I'm finding this year, I'm I, I overthink things, which is what I you know try not to do. So, I just want to feel more and think less. That's one of my goals. Really good tip. 
Mm -hmm. So what is something that a lot of people don't know about you? Jeez. I don't know. I'm pretty open. (laughs) I think Um, my right leg is an inch and a half longer than my left leg. Okay. How'd you find out that? Oh, because when I had my car accident, I actually broke my right femur and they had to cut out like six inches on my right femur. So when they put it together, it's a little bit longer. So if I stand on my right foot, I'm like five foot two. If I stand on my left leg, I'm like five foot and a half. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So it does it cause you any issues when you're running or anything? Uh, no, that's why I love running. It's one of the things that doesn't actually bother me, I think. And again, like this is why health and stuff is so important. And I actually have no issues. Not at all. Great. Mm-hmm. Besides your own, what is one health book you can recommend to the audience? The China Study. All right. Good one. Mm -hmm. So if there was someone that you would sit down to lunch with, anyone at all, who would you pick and where would you go? Oh, boy. I'm not good at this fire questions. No, no. It's okay. (laughs) First thing, there's no right or wrong answer, whatever comes to mind. I want to have lunch with. Dead or alive? I would say President Obama. I know it's crazy, but I really don't love to have lunch. Or no, the first lady. Okay. That's what I love to have lunch with. Okay. And just because, I mean, she's gone, they've gone through so much. I mean, they're in the public eye all the time. They've had gone through so much, like they've gone through so much good things. They've gone through so much scrutiny. They get so much um, positive and negative attention. And it's just like, how do you, you know, keep going and keep staying positive and, and, and really making a difference in the world? Okay. And where would you go? I would go to... Probably ABC Kitchen, which is one of my favorite restaurants in New York. Okay. I haven't I haven't heard of it. You, Mark? Yeah, I have heard of it. I've been there. I love it. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And Peggy, last one here. What is your specialty in the kitchen? I'm sure you have a ton, but if what's the first one you can think oh, of? Oh, sweets. As much as I talk about no sugar, it's <laughs> desserts. <laughs> which, which? Uh, probably, probably any kind of... Like whether it's like I do yummy grain-free pancakes in the morning or whether it's cupcakes. I'm really good at really healthy cupcakes. And do you have those recipes in your book? And why don't you just tell us about your books? I do have those recipes in my books. So my most recent book is called Kitchen Gears. It's basically your go-to solutions guide to help you look and feel your best. So every single chapter is on a certain ailment. So whether, you know, things we talked about, stress, energy, libido, muffin tops, PMS, uh, menopause, heart disease, bone health, joint health, inflammation, whatever it is that ails you, go to that chapter, tells you the key nutrients your body needs and the top foods that'll help you get under your funk no matter what you feel. Okay. And while we're on that, where is some areas people can go online to connect with you, find out more about you? Yeah, you can go to uh, PeggyK.com is my website. You can get through all my social media handles through there. So Instagram is Peggy underscore K. Twitter is Be Vibrant Health. And um, you can get my Facebook page through my website again at PeggyK.com. Awesome. So listeners, go and connect with Peggy and head over to our website as well, ultimatehealthpodcast.com and use the search search box on the right-hand side and type in Peggy K and her post with all the information on things we talked about. That'll all be there and uh, you guys will enjoy it. Peggy, last thing we want to ask you, and this is one question we ask all the guests and we end on every show, is what is one thing that you can leave us with that we can implement right away to help us reach ultimate health? Just add an extra serving of greens to your diet every single day. I like it. That's great. So even just like a handful of spinach. A handful of spinach, um, you know, like it can be, you know, like a greens powder to your smoothie, a handful of spinach, handful of kale, add an extra serving of broccoli to your dinner, something like that. I like it. Easy. And the people are going to feel that difference right away. So awesome. Peggy, thank you so much for coming on. This uh, was so informative and and we had fun. And yeah, it's fun too. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. Okay, so listeners, our last thing for you is if you haven't done so already, please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you guys and what you think of the show. And thank you for listening. We'll be in touch soon and have a great day. Have an awesome day and eat more greens. 